Good afternoon, Michael Miles here with a very special guest. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us the always awesome Jack Posobiec, host on OANN. Uh, your new book is called what? Uh, well, my new book, the latest project, is the Agent Poso Task Force Aegis, this uh, this graphic novel series that okay. we put together. Last book was 40 Warfare, yep. uh, New Doctrine for uh, New Generation of Politics. So you are, I first heard your name, and I hate the word activist, because I always say an activist is someone who has nothing to do with their life. I first heard your name because you and Laura Loomer... Yes. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> yes. The, the, always, we always went to, interesting. We went to a show. <laughs> we, went to, we went to a play in the park. You so. were the guys who stormed that Julius Caesar play that was in Central Park. We did do that. Um, yeah. And I, I, that, where it's Trump at Qua Caesar is being assassinated live on stage. Yeah, sponsored you, you by you Citibank. Act- so I've only actually seen half of the play. I was wanting to know how it ends. <laughs> I don't know. I've only seen the first half. I think Romeo and Juliet killed themselves. Is my do they do they do they get better? <laughs> <laughs> they get better. It gets better. No, but I, I always bring up that play because it's such a contrast to when there was that video that was recently photoshopped or uh, doctored, as they would say, of that scene from that movie, and they have Trump's head, and he's stabbing CNN, he's stabbing NBC, oh, right, 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 and he's right, right. blowing the, up all these uh, things. It's uh, kind of Royal Rumble the thing. Kingsman. The Kingsman. Kingsman. Yeah, the Kingsman. And it was shared in a room that was empty, as Andy No kind of pointed out. You know, so I was at that conference. Oh, tell me about that. I was okay. at that conference. Uh, I spoke there. Um, I know some of the organizers just from previous events. And when I first... So they got reached out to from the New York Times, from Maggie Haberman. She reached out and said, hey, what's going on with this video? (laughs) Maggie Haberman is 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 special by New York Times standards, let's say. And so they contact me and they say, hey, Jack, did you play some video in one of your speeches, in one of your breakout sessions? I said, no, I didn't play any videos. What are you talking about? Uh, and then we were trying to get a hold of Carpe Doncum, but he was, you know, flying around. We couldn't find him. He was, he was, it was after the conference had ended. And finally, by the time it comes up and we find a copy of this video, we're all looking at it. We say, what is this video? No one has seen this video. And we find out that it had been playing in some like back room where someone had just taken like a third party person had just taken a, you know, a computer and it said it hooked up to a TV and just typed in like Trump memes on YouTube and was just letting it roll. Right. And it had just come up randomly. And it becomes, in corporate media, Trump plays video where he assassinates, you know, yeah. politicians right. to the delight of his audience. It's literally, a, and they showed the room. It's a, a monitor on a room in the side. No one was in there. No one was playing in front of an audience or anything like that. But the point is, even if they had, when Julius, when Trump is being murdered on stage, uh, sponsored by corporate money in Central Park. Sponsored that, by New York Times. Yeah. Oh, New York Times too. New York Times, was their, their parent company was an, a sponsor of the play where Julius Caesar as Trump is being assassinated every night. At Central Park. At Central that Park. obscure location. Yeah, you know, very no obscure. One, no one's, no one's no not, heard not of familiar. It. But that's our t- but now it's like, oh my God, we're promoting political Yeah, violence. that's what And by the way, so I, and speaking of as from when I was actually in the audience, right? This this crowd, um, they're laughing. They're laughing, they're cracking up because, you know, the wife is supposed to be Melania and she's got this very outrageous, you know, Eastern European accent. It's it's completely over the top, right? And the crowd is 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 rolling with laughter. So I mean, okay, you could say it's artistic, you can say it's it's art, and you can make that argument. Fine, if that's your position, right? That's your position. I took a different position, but that's sure. okay, because that's also okay. Um they said, Are you yeah, I remember so people were saying, Well, Jack, did you you know, aren't you for free speech? Don't they have freedom of speech? I said, yeah, but so do I. Yeah. Yeah, so I added my free speech to their free speech. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have heard your proposal. Here's my counterpoint. Right, exactly. You. Yeah, exactly. I, I can have free speech as well, right? You know, this is, and this this is a watershed, really was a watershed moment for, uh, you know, I, it was it was a moment of activism. There's, I mean, there's no question about that. Um, but it was a watershed moment because you don't usually see the right doing stuff like that. You don't yeah. see the right, you know, going into uh, an area, I mean, Central Park, theater right i mean this is like mean, someone uh as somebody pointed out to me it said jack you defiled their temple yeah <laughs> you no know? i mean this yeah. is this is to the left this is the theater is their high you know this is the high church of progressivism and a theater stage is i mean that's that's basically uh their altar right yeah. you defiled that that's why they were so mad at you um and so for them to say that that's art but then turn around and say well if a conservative does it or if somebody Carpe Doncum, or actually it wasn't Carpe Doncum, but if anybody, whoever did it on on YouTube does that, well, that's the worst thing in the world, and we all have to, you know, uh, come to account for this, and do you support this, and you have to disavow that and everything. And we're just like, I didn't even see it. It's a stupid video. Who cares? Well, in their defense, YouTube caused Benghazi, right? 
Exactly. So no, YouTube caused Benghazi. YouTube has caused a lot of problems. YouTube is turning people into the right now. We've seen this with children. You've seen these. They, there was that article. There's other New York, New York Times again, right? They have West this, Virginia. This weird yeah. thing you know, with, the, with, the, with the New York Times. There's this one. This woman said, "Wow, well, my my son. He started out watching." Uh, uh, Jordan Peterson videos. I don't know why she talks like Oscar the Grouch, but she does. Because um, she, she's garbage. Yeah, she, yeah exactly. <laughs> and she goes, oh, she was watching the Jordan Peterson videos, and then it, it led to Donald Trump videos, and then Pepe the Frog got involved, and I don't even know what happened. But then what was really funny is you actually... Uh, and then there's this whole, you know, the New York Times goes on and on and on about, oh, they're radicalizing the children, they're radicalizing the children. If you actually followed the story, towards the end, she pointed out that the kid said, yeah, but I kind of stopped watching those videos after a while. And then I started watching some stuff about video games. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I just, because there's this, there's this interesting sense where they take personal agency out of it. Right. So the algorithm serves you things and you, you're locked into the algorithm. So you can't you know, you can't have any personal agency again if you're on the right. Well, they, I think they're accurately describing their audience. Yes, they are. And and uh, people read The New York Times to be trained what to do. Right, and, this is projection right? Yeah, because yes. they know they're telling you what they do and how they think of their audience, right. not in terms of, you know, and this this is this is quite illustrative. And there was there was a great line that. Um, I was at dinner last night and Tony Schaefer was speaking and he, and he said it and, and I'm totally going to steal it from him, but I'll credit him. Uh, so he said, he said, the left wants to be judged on their intentions. The right wants to be judged on their accomplishments, like the, the end, right? And I think that's so illustrative here is that, well, we didn't, we didn't intend to do that. We didn't intend to do this. So what well, doesn't matter is what happened, right? And this is this is where you get into the uh, well, that wasn't real socialism, right? Right, right, right because we didn't intend for all of these things to happen. So obviously, it must have been you know it must have been something else because our intentions were so pure. This is why I, when I, I recently donated blood and I told all my followers to go out and donate blood. A, it's it doesn't take a lot of time, and you're I mean, if someone needs blood, it's it's not it's a serious matter. But B, next time someone throws in your face, what have you ever done? And go, I donate blood, and you're objectively better than ninety percent of these jackasses on social media who do nothing. They don't they don't donate blood. What do you mean? They, they, not, they I, I don't have blood. I've, I've, I'm I've, saying I've, these people who are, are internet activists who are just yeah. like pointing out racism, they're not fucking donating blood. They're really? Just, they have the, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 no, I mean, I mean, well, that's amazing. Right, because again, it's to them, the virtue signal is an act. Correct. To them, the virtue signal is an act. This is why... Uh, uh, this is why Antifa sees themselves as, as being able to be justified to use violence because to them... Your intentions, your feelings, your emotions, your statements, your speech is so opposite of what they believe that they perceive it to be violence. So in them, in their mindset, they're justified to use violence back. So it's self-defense. People talk a lot of smack on Twitter around all of us. What is the one biggest misconception about you? You know, it's it's so weird because uh, the far you go to the far left and they say that I'm a crypto Nazi. Sure. You go to the far right. They say that I'm a crypto Mossad agent. Oh yeah, I, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, 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 it, it sounds crazy saying this, but they, the people believe these these wild conspiracies about me on both sides. Where I say, look, you know, I have served in the intelligence community, right? I have been. Uh, I was in the Navy. I was in military intelligence. Um, you know, there are parts of my life that I just can't talk about. Sure. But <laughs> to fill that in with something so insane and specific and and very specific without a shred of evidence whatsoever, it's it's mind boggling to sit there and see serious people at times interacting with it and saying, hey, maybe maybe, maybe Pasobic is this, you know, some kind of secret agent for one of these guys. And it's, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. You guys know. I love my Heshi socks, H-E-S-H-I socks.com. If you use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your entire order. As I have my ad copy here, it says spring is here and summer's around the, summer's around the corner. Let me tell you something. They're good all year round. Why I like and I wear my Heshi socks is that they're cushioned. They don't wear out at the heel like some other companies that I used to wear do. You could have ones for work. You could have ones for play. They have antimicrobial properties, so even though they're kind of thick, they don't smell. They're so comfortable. I swear by them. If you go to H-E-S-H-I-Socks.com and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your entire order. I, I can't say enough good things about my Heshi socks, and I'm so glad they're sponsoring the show again. Okay, here's something else that's great about Heshi. They have what they call stay-up technology. I don't know if that's a technical term. Meaning you pull them up. They're not always dragging down to your ankles. Wear them for a hike, wear them to the gym, wear them to the office, wear them on a date, wear them around the house. They're like pillows for your feet. 
HeshiSocks.com. So we're taping this on Friday. It's airing Tuesday. I woke up with, to something very uh, uh, nice, I guess. So Ben Shapiro uh, just recently went after what he called the new right, or people call themselves the new right. And you hit him back hard, and you said... Let, why, don't you, why don't you put it from your point of view? Well, from my point of view, I think... And just recap what happened. I think Ben and uh, and more so Charlie Kirk right now are, are involved in this dispute between themselves and uh, Nick Fuentes and a group of people that refer to themselves as the dissident right. Um, but Ben and Charlie have kind of pointed out that you guys are just sort of the alt-right under it with better sure. optics, right? You know, you're, you're like the alt-right 2.0. Um, so that, you know, the all, original alt-right being sort of the Richard Spencer crew, um, then Nick Fuentes and these guys, you know, okay, you call yourselves a dissident, right? But you're basically the same people, you know, Nick actually was at Charlottesville. Uh, and so you're just using different tactics. So you're still kind of the same people. Um, but then when, and Ben was delivering a speech, uh, so what they've been doing is they've been coming to uh, Turning Point USA events. And then Ben was giving a speech, uh, I guess at a YAF event, but you know, these college speeches, uh, around the country, and they've been trolling, they've been asking, in some cases, kind of more serious questions about immigration policy, and in other cases, uh, just very trolly questions yeah. about, you know, whatever meme they just saw on 4chan or something. And um, Ben gives this speech, sort of just throwing it back on them, saying, you're all you're all still the alt-right, you know, you're nothing has really changed, you're just changing your tactics, you're still the same people. But then he threw the new right in with all of that. And he said, and some of these people call themselves the new right, and they're really just the alt-right who are trying to pretend that they're not. And that's what I specifically pushed back. I, I don't disagree with Ben on, on largely on everything else he was saying, but that specific use of the new right label, um, I, I thought was completely incorrect. And it was hilarious because even even when I was was saying that last night, I it hadn't even dawned on me to say, wait a minute, I've, I've got malice tomorrow. <laughs> he wrote the whole book about yeah. this. And, and it was clear to me that... Ben and you know whoever he worked with to help him on that speech to do the he just hasn't done the research on this he hasn't done the reading he hasn't done the understanding and or you know to the extent uh, that he has looked into it he's he's realized that these are people in like the broader MAGA movement the broader new right that he wants to fence out right that he wants to be the gatekeeper of and and push them to the side and say well you're not um, you know you're not true conservatives you're not real conservatives not like not like me you know people have been around people supported the Iraq war we are real conservatives David French and Jonah Goldberg and Bill Crystal etc so that's what I think was trying to happen here is that he may have have in trying to respond to the Nick Fuentes to the Nick Fuentes uh, group and to these this trolling, he was trying to launch a broader fencing type argument against uh, a, a number of people that he sees either as opponents or competitors. First of all, I think you have we have to give him credit because the old MO would be pretend this isn't happening. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going to take this issue on head on, right? right? Because this kind of blew up pretty heavily in Charlie Kirk's face. Um, uh, do you think that he's basically uh, – and you, uh, do you think Ben is trying to set himself up to be the new William F. Buckley? Because for decades, William F. Buckley, who is the head of the National Review, and I discuss this in the book also, viewed his role as being the one who says, no one to the right of me is part of acceptable discourse. And that was his job, and basically that was the kind of the devil's handshake he made with the left. Um, and now that Buckley is you know, uh, roommates with the Kennedys and bin Laden, uh, there isn't a person in that position. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's exactly um, the role that he's trying to fashion. For I mean, this was, and, and that's exactly why he brought in the new right and exactly why he's, he was broadening the scope of the people he was talking about because he was trying to say that, um, uh, Exactly what you said, that anyone to the right of me is is disreputable and you can't listen to them and uh, nobody should lis you know, listen to these ideas and I'm I'm the line, me, right. right here. And so he's trying to set up this very big umbrella, shield, fence, gatekeeping, whatever you want to call it, um, of himself as being that line. And anyone on the, on the other side is he, you know, he is the edge of the overs and window and, and none, none shall pass. But it's also uh, a little, conf and the, the criticism he's gotten in return, which I'm sure he's not uh, um, uh, oblivious to, is that he is routinely, and I would say non-ironically, because how these people think, described as a Nazi and a white nationalist. And, and there, he's called this every day, every five minutes. And 
uh, I would think that he would a- a- at least grapple with how is it that you are unfairly called a Nazi and a white supremacist. Now, there are certainly plenty of Nazis and white supremacists in Charlotte or whatever, but if he's going to have this broad umbrella include people like you and Cernovich in the same thing as Richard Spencer, well, how are you making that distinction? Which, by the way, there's a tweet of his uh, that a lot of people have brought up from 2016 where he makes a list of who he believes are, are members of the alt-right or alt-right friendly, as yeah. he calls it. And Donald Trump is on the list and Ron Paul is on the list as well. Uh, as well as Cernovich and just a whole bunch of other people that, and then also with Richard Spencer. And so it's like, I think anyone just looking at that objectively would not consider those people to hold similar ideas. Right. I, the and, similarity is who they're against. Right. The similarity yeah. is who they're against. And, and how they view the approach, which is we're not going to engage. We got to, you know, bring a wrecking ball because these people are not playing fair. Yeah. You've got to be, you've got to be Donald Trump Jr. on his recent appearance on The View, right? Right. Just, just coming in and just dropping it. Roman Polanski, Jeffrey Epstein, you with the blackface and just, just dropping it on all of them. I'm not going to accept your framing. I'm right. not going to accept your arguments. This, you are not operating in good faith. So why should I? Um, and, uh, here's why I think it gets very uh, dangerous to op- to pretend these people are operating in good faith. Uh, obviously, you and I are both fans of the red pill, the concept of the red pill, and the red pill being when you realize, oh, it's not that people have a bias, it's that they have an agenda and you're being lied to systemically. Right. And what happened this week with Amy Robach when it came out that ABC News for three years had uh, information that, about this international rape ring and the only person so far having consequences is the person who not leaked it. The, did you know about this? So the girl who was at ABC, someone who was at ABC, right, went to CBS. They don't know that she's the one who leaked it. All they, they could figure out from the search history is that she viewed it, right? Mm. ABC called CBS and got her fired. So she's fired because they find her... In other, this, you, you make a lot of whistleblower connections here. Yes, um, but they find her some evidence that she was tied to this footage. No, yeah, they right. They know she saw it. They right. don't know they she's the one who leaked it. it. She could have given it to someone who then made it public, right? Right. They don't know that. All they know is at one point she accessed this information. They ABC got CBS to fire her. Right. So again, we're seeing this. Right. When you see the the machinations. Yes. Right. Of. ABC, CBS, working in concert to maintain a narrative, to maintain that fence, to maintain that 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 ideology, or even even you could call it that that narrative, that public narrative that has to be forward facing. Uh, you combine that with everything that only Amy Robach says in that clip, right. right? And it's this is actually I I personally think this is James O'Keefe's biggest story. Oh, easily. I th- I think it's easily his biggest story because you know he always talks about, and and others have said this that you know journalism is speaking truth to power. Journalism is reporting on the stories that people in power don't want reported. Yes. Right? And so what he's done, and that's here, what they say. What they he's print. done, right? That's what they say. They right? say, right? yeah. Democracy dies in darkness, right? Um, what he did was show a glimpse beyond the veil yeah he peeled back the curtain and it's and it's incredible so it's this isn't you know people on the right saying oh there's a bias oh you're not telling the truth this is no this is this is you're seeing it in you in your own words a good morning america 2020 anchor reporter correspondent is saying these things we had the information we knew it we had it dead to rights we had facts we had evidence we had photographs and then and they said oh well what happened well, the royal family told us to kill the story. Yeah. Oh, so okay. we couldn't get interviews with uh, Meghan Markle. Right, but even but even think about that. So the royal family of the UK kills the story. All right, yeah, sure, okay, let's go with that. Right, and so you're realizing that this is probably the biggest red pill yeah. that anyone has seen because this is like this is you know to somebody sitting back home, it's like wait a minute, you turn the camera off and all of a sudden these people turn into Alex Jones. Right. That's the thing. So it, it, it wasn't like anyone, her staff was like, oh, you're crazy. She said, on, we have the audio, I 100% think he was murdered, right? She wasn't like, it probably happened. No one around her was like, come on, Amy, calm down. No, everyone was, no one thought it was odd that she was saying that. Meanwhile- and she felt safe. Right. She felt safe in that area. No, look, look. I know I'm in a studio right now. There's headphones. There's a microphone. When I'm doing my show on One American News, I know 
that, you know, I'm on microphone. I know people are listening sure. to me. I know that my words are being recorded in some sense. You don't, you don't forget that you're on microphone. Right. So she knows that she's going to face no repercussions right. for what she's saying. Not she even socially that like that. People right. would be like, oh, right. she's a weirdo. No, one, right. And that's the thing. And the camera comes on. People who think this, it's a wacky conspiracy theory. ABC News, let me uh, drop a red pill for everyone. Not that all my audience is red pill already. ABC News covering this story up was a conspiracy. You had a bunch of people, executives at ABC, who had this information, legal and other executives, and they sat down and they said, we have to do everything in our power to keep this away from the public. They had an alternative. What if, here's a scenario, what if the Queen's lawyers were really strong and they say, if you run this, we'll sue the fuck out of you, right? Because there's not enough or it makes Prince Philip look bad or so on and so forth. They could have, and this has happened many times in the past, leaked that to the New York Times, which is failing badly, or somewhere else to be like, okay, we got a sexual predator who is at this moment preying on kids and this powerful people. We can't publicly put it out there because we're going to get sued to death, but let's make sure that information gets out there to save these this kids. Is, this is very similar to uh, things that happened with whistleblowers in the tobacco industry in the 1990s. Um, there were people that were coming forward. There's there's movies about this with like, like Al Pacino, you know, talking about how... And um, uh, Russell Crowe, I forget the name of the movie, but they talk about this where he was a whistleblower from the, you know, from inside the tobacco industries coming forward saying, look, they, they knew that these additives were not just carcinogenic, that they were habit forming and they wanted more of that in the product. And so that when they all got up there and they called the seven dwarves, right, the seven little dwarves of, you know, you know, we, we had no evidence and they all they all raised their hand. They were all lying because they knew at that time right. and because he had the evidence, he had the documents and he was going, I think it was 60 minutes, I could be wrong on that, but it was, yeah, I think it was 60 minutes that he was gonna go forward on that 60 minutes killed the story initially because of legal pressure from the tobacco industry. Now, eventually, eventually they did get it forward, right? But this is the same type of things that we've seen is that people in power do not like when there is reporting on them and that they use their legal abilities, they use their influence to be able to shut down those stories. And so there have been times in the past where journalists, actual journalists have stood up to that and they'll use those powers of, hey, I'm going to leak this to the Washington Post. I'm going to yeah. leak this to the New York Times. I'm going to get stuff out there to make it so that the story gets out because the story getting to the public is our job. People talk a lot of smack on Twitter around all of us. What is the one biggest misconception about you? So there's this this tweet of mine, this trolley tweet of mine from 2016, where I just I had written in all caps, I love Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is like the greatest guy ever. And, uh, you know, I can't wait for him to be president. There are serious conservatives in like the Never Trump movement who take that tweet and say, look, Posobiec was a Sanders supporter who eventually became a Trump supporter. He's not a true conservative at all. But that's Cassandra Fairbanks. Exactly. And what would be what would be wrong with that even if it were true? What if you – isn't that great that you went from Sanders to Trump from their perspective? It's it's just – it's wild. And it's and it's also just like, no, I've, I've, I've always – look, I was kind of like a basic Republican guy going through – I was college Republicans. I was, uh, you know, young Republicans. And now I do this. Like I've, I've always been pretty much you know, just a Republican. Your Welcome is sponsored by Wix.com, W-I-X.com. And if you go to – let that be your welcome.com. You can see the site that they put together for us, or we use their technology to put the site together. So here's what you can do. You can grow your business with a custom online store and live chat and a straight out of the box booking system. You could publish your website in a second and make edits fast. And you can use SEO and marketing tools to drive traffic to your sites with automatic web hosting. Everything you need for your web business is there. If you go to wix.com slash welcome, you can learn more about what Wix offers you. Guys, just sell your crap from your house, and then you'll be telling me you're welcome. And I'll be saying, how did you get my contact info? I don't want to hear from you. Let's get back to the show. Do, so this is something I disagree with about conservatives. I want to hear your opinion. I do not think this is a Republican-Democrat thing. I think this is an elite power versus the average person kind of thing. Um, is that your perspective or do you think it's much more Republican, the Democrats are doing something like this? No, absolutely think it's like that. I think I think there are people uh, on the right in the Republican Party, certainly in the Republican establishment, who will fight tooth and nail to stay within the good graces 
of the power structure right. so that they can continue to receive their contracts, they can receive their speaking gigs on CNN, they can go around corporate America and do you know, and do their speaking gigs and get paid, you know, lots of money for that. So they'll do everything they can to stay within that narrative and within that framework. They won't mess with it too much. They'll stick to these sort of, you know, issues on the side, you know, they'll, you know, you know we'll talk about climate change, you know, sure. something that doesn't necessarily threaten anyone directly in power. They'll talk about, uh, you know, same-sex marriage. They'll talk about uh, uh, legalization of marijuana. Are we doing that? We're we not going to do that. It's it's something, which, you know, clearly it's going one way on that. But they won't talk about any of these things that implicate the power structure. One of the things, so let's talk about this, because whenever, like, you and I interact on Twitter, you have a lot of haters, Right. And I always get hit. With, I do. You do. I don't. It's surprising. I don't know what it is. You're a much nicer person than me. Uh, but you're also much more successful than me on Twitter. So I always get hit with this photo of you and Richard Spencer that you went to Richard Spencer's wedding. You guys are best friends. Clear that up. What is your relationship with Richard? Yeah. So um, uh, just in in uh, basic terms, uh, I think Richard Spencer is a scumbag. I think he's a loser. He's a douche. He's fat. Um, I completely disagree with all of his ideas i've always disagreed with them i've always repudiated them back going back to so going back to 2016 there was this there was this issue that the maga movement had and i'll be open about this you know i, I know that like you know some of like the official republicans won't talk about this but there were people who were coming from a white nationalist perspective that were coming from this this alt-right perspective that were trying to throw on maga hats and and get into our movement um, as a way to sort of launder their ideas forward, right? So he would show up to our events, right? And and act as if he had been, you know, invited or act if he had been there. So I remember back in 2017, I held this rally outside the White House for Steve Bannon. It was, Steve Bannon was kind of on the bubble. And um, it, wanted, it was a keep Bannon rally. It's back when I was with Rebel Media. And, and I'm out there, my wife comes, um, a bunch of supporters come, and we're just, you know, flying American flags, they keep Bannon. Well, then Richard Spencer and two guys with cameras show up. And they start taking pictures as if they're part of the thing. I'm like, what are you, what are you guys doing here? I didn't, even, I didn't invite you. I don't know you. Why are you here? Right. And then so we have to go and cut our footage to edit him out because we didn't want anyone to think that right. we had brought him there. Then later in 2017, he I'm, I'm scheduled to speak at this event at the Lincoln Memorial. And uh it's, it's me, it's Laura Loomer, Cassandra Fairbanks, and then there's this like special guest, special guest. And I, I wasn't the organizer of the event. And so finally, about about two weeks out before the event, I say, I say look, guys, you know, I, you know I, I'm not going to say anything publicly. I go to the organizer and say, you got to tell me who the special guest is. I got sure. I got know who I'm speaking with. You know, what's, you know what, what's the deal? He said, oh, it's Richard Spencer. It's going to be great. What? <laughs> what do you mean it's going to be Richard Spencer? You know, you know we're up here. And I wanted to speak about violence because this was, again, around the same time as uh, the Shakespeare in the Park, right. around the same time as the Steve Scalise shooting. And we, we were doing this really big push against Antifa violence. And, you know, we could see that as violence against Trump supporters was beginning, that there was a reactionary force that was growing in relation to that. And we see that in a lot of the scuffles that now happen between these the battles of Berkeley and different things. Uh, and, and, you know, being a prior uh, Navy intelligence officer, I, I know that violence has a downward spiral. So yeah. I didn't want to do that. So we, were, we said, let's just do a nonpartisan rally against violence. Well, then they bring in Richard Spencer. I said, so we drop out. We say, no, no, we're not going to do an event with him because we don't, number one, we don't agree with that guy. And number two, we don't think that he believes this stuff. So we go and hold an event against him, against hate speech against violence at the White House at the same day he holds his event at the Lincoln Memorial. So we've been against this. Then at some point during the course of that, he posts this picture and he says, he says, oh, here's a picture of me and my good buddy, Jack Posobiec. And I'm looking at this thing, no memory of ever taking a picture with this guy. The only time I remember seeing him in public was outside the Trump Hotel once. I mean, in person, right? outside the Trump hotel once and you know, it was kind of his crew and my crew and it was like a Jets and Sharks kind of thing where like we almost went to blows. Um, or another time at, at the Deplora Ball, which was our inaugural ball, we held um, 20, well, I guess early 2017, uh, he tried to get in, we banned him. Uh, then he shows up at our after party. We almost uh, had to, you know, almost had somebody who actually came to like, like, like 
beat the crap out of him. And uh, we eventually said, no, 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 let's, you know, let's, let's, let's not get the police involved in here. Let's just, you know, try to get him out. So he posts this picture and I have no recollection of it. So to me, I think the thing is Photoshopped. And he says, or I guess one of his followers I saw said once, no, no, you were at this thing at the RNC and we all came up to you and we were taking pictures and you took that picture. And I'm like, I've, I've no memory of that whatsoever. And I think it's Photoshopped. They claim that they just came up to me and like some guy said, hey, take a picture, you know. I've done this. This is what what uh, Nick Fuentes just did to Michael Knowles uh, not too long ago at the uh, Politicon, I think, where it just somebody comes up, you take a picture, you don't know who it is, and then they try to use that as a way to get in trouble. So you were never at his wedding? <laughs> no, that part of it I don't even get. I get I get hear this on Twitter all the time. I yeah, I I don't even know when the guy got married. I don't know where he got married. I don't know his wife's name. I like I I literally haven't even heard that before today. Uh, why did you come to my show wearing a Kamala Harris t-shirt? Well, the reason, quite honestly, is that I knew we were in New York and I knew there would be a ton of Kamala Harris supporters here. And I just thought, I just thought it would blend in. No, actually, no, the bacon shirt, these are all my favorite food groups. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a listing in order, by the way, it's, you know, you know, for one to 10 of my favorite food groups. I was bacon in the month club. I have the, st the card still on my fridge. Amazing. Yeah. So um, do you, th here, here's the big argument that people on the right have. Has the, the there are two scenarios, both of which I think are plausible. One is that the left has gotten crazier. The second is that they've always been this crazy, but now the mask has dropped. Does it matter? Yeah. Well, I guess there's 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 different parts of the left, right? And I and I'll 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 be credible about this because there are liberals and there are leftists. Sure. And the leftists are that's the far left. Sure. That's that's your Antifa left. Um, and I've done a lot of work studying Antifa. I'm doing a book on Antifa pretty soon here that's coming out. And those guys, they trace their ideology. I mean, they go back so far. We're talking like the anarchist socialist movement of the 1800s. Emma Goldman, baby. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, um, you know, the Haymarket. Louis Ling. Uh, Do you know about him? Yeah. Yeah. So Louis Ling, who is a badass, when he was arrested, there was a Haymarket riot. Mm -hmm. Bomb was thrown. Cops died. Right. They arrested a bunch of dudes. Uh, Lewis Ling said, I couldn't have thrown that bomb. I was at home making bombs. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, but he's um, just like, fuck you. Amazing, yeah. right? Amazing. Um, uh, President President McKinley is shot by one of these guys, by, yes. by a socialist, right? So we've we've had times, and you know, regardless of, you know, you, you can even, the official story, by the way, is that JFK was also shot by a communist. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, not to get into that, but but the official story is that he's shot by a card-carrying communist. Right. Right. And so this idea that the radical left is anything new sure. is is something that, uh, that they themselves reject. That if you actually look at the people on the radical left, if you spend time on Antifa websites... <clears throat> They trace their own history back to uh, back to all of this stuff, back to uh, the pre-unionization fight, sure. um, the the Spanish Civil War. Um, they actually uh, one of, one of the things that I think I'm one of the only people in America who's who's done report, uh, serious reporting on is the fact that Antifa was involved in Syria. Right? I did not know this. How how so? Right, and so nobody wants to talk about this. But if you go back, go check any major Antifa account: New York City Antifa, London Antifa, and Back when, so you remember in the Kurds, right? A couple of weeks ago, everyone was talking about, oh, the Kurds, the Kurds. They're all dead. And, you know, genocide. You know, the Turkey is going to come in. Genocide, Kurds. yeah. So every Antifa account was tweeting about the Kurds. And they said, how, how dare you do this? We stand in solidarity with the Kurds. We stand in solidarity with the Rojava Revolution. I said, the Rojava Revolution? What's that? You know, and this is something that I'd, I'd seen mentioned throughout their literature and throughout their writings. And essentially what was happening is, do you remember... Back like 2013, 2014, Vice and Rolling Stone and a bunch of places, they would do these stories about Americans, you know, the short order cook or the bike messenger sure. who were going over to fight ISIS and they were going over and you know, on their own dime and, you know, Americans and Canadians and Germans and British getting involved. You remember those yeah, stories? Of course, yeah. Well, the part that they didn't mention and the part that Vice left out about all that stuff is those guys were Antifa. Ah. Uh, and so what they were doing is they were going over. And they were working with a radical leftist branch of the Kurds, 
uh, known as the PKK, which are essentially communists. And what they were trying to do was set up an autonomous, and but like this is just, it's in their own writings. So you can go look at this. Um, they were trying to set up this autonomous, uh, anarcho-socialist state called Rojava in Northeast Syria. And that's why they were going over. So were they fighting ISIS? Yes, they were fighting ISIS, but they were fighting ISIS because they're communists and they were trying to set up a communist paradise in the Kurdish desert for some reason. And so this is why, so Turkey then points at this and says, we don't want these guys on our borders. Are you right. kidding me? This would be crazy. And so that's where you had so many people coming in and, you know, of course, you know, how many of the Kurds are actually believing in that stuff? It's right, it's not that many, but the most militant ones maybe are these guys, right? And so, of course, Erdogan uses that to smear all the Kurds. Then you've got people pointing in and say, wait, 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 you know, not all the Kurds are like that. That's just some of them. There's, there's just a couple of nut jobs over there. It's like saying all Americans are Antifa or something like that. Um, but we, but the fact is that Antifa viewed that as something that was absolutely integral to their ideology, to their activism. And in the sense where, you know, I was looking at, you know, uh, the London Antifa, just, just Twitter account, and they say, hey, we're gonna have a big meeting about uh, Kurdish independence at the KCC Center. Uh -oh. The KCC, what's the KCC? Kurdish Cultural Center of London. So London Antifa, a revolutionary violent organization is, hosting their meetings at the Curtis Cultural Center of London. Huh. See, seems kind of newsworthy. I don't know. How come? So why do you think no one's made those connections here? Is it because the corporate press doesn't want to report Antifa because it's too... Uh, because... Uh, the narrative? So for two reasons, for two reasons. Number one, because the corporate press doesn't want to connect, uh, you know, to make Antifa look bad. Number two, because anti-ISIS was the, was the corporate line for so long, but also that essentially... Because the U.S. government during uh, the previous administration and uh, a little bit during during uh, even on the Trump administration, they were funding these groups. Uh, and what they did was and there's been generals that have come out and explained all this. What they what they wanted was they were trying to overthrow Assad in in Syria. Right. They wanted regime change. They were very open about this. Really Clinton was about this. Barack Obama said this. Uh, the NATO was saying this. Everybody was saying Assad has to go. Right. And this is where the red lines came in and all this other stuff. And so what they were doing is they were going around and funding pretty much any opposition group they could find in Syria or in the hinterlands. And whether it be the Turkish Arab militias, whether it could be the Sunni Wahhabists or these PKK guys up in the north, whatever, you're anti-Assad, you're on our side. Here's some money, here's some weapons, go for it, right? And this is what leads to the birth of ISIS because eventually some people, some of those guys got that, got that money and got the weapons and say, hey, what if we don't fight Assad? What if we just start our own country over here? Yeah, let's do that. That's a great idea. And that's that's where you get ISIS. And so that screws up the entire thing. Something just, well, I hope, oh, I guess that just- Yeah, that thing just dropped okay. down. Yeah, we've got, okay. you got a poltergeist in here or something? Several, poltergeist. We have several. Polters, several, <laughs> several polters. Polters, guys. Let me push back a little bit, right? Antifa in their ideology and old school leftists are very anti-corporate. And anyway, to answer your question, oh, I, to answer your question, I think that this radical left has always been there. Yeah, well, and and, and it's funny to me when libertarians are like, "Oh, I can't believe these uh, communists call themselves anarchists." It's like they have the they're the they were the first anarchist asshole. Learn yeah. your history. Yeah. So you libert and caps do not have the right to that term. Now you could say they're they're oxymoron, a self contradiction, blah blah blah. Uh, not only did they have that term first, they actually implemented it. Barcelona was a anarchist for a brief period, like during the Spanish Civil War. So we have had communist anarchism on earth. We've not had Ancapistan yet. So people shouldn't learn their history. But the question I have for you is Antifa. But wasn't the idea that, wasn't the idea that it was anarchy to the current system in order to found a new system? No, they wanted to have it be complete decentralization. Emma Goldman, who is one of my favorite people because she's such a, a badass, she got deported by J. Edgar Hoover under Woodrow Wilson's administration in the wake of all this to Russia, where she hadn't been in like 35 years. And she's there and they're like, it's, they're so excited. This is the Russian Revolution. This is a new age in humanity. And all the anarchists are being murdered and sent to gulags. And there's complete no freedom of speech. And she's like, what the hell is going on? She meets with Lenin. He's like, sorry, like in the in the transition period, you, you have to have this absolute dictatorship. She escapes. 
She writes two books, My Disillusionment in Russia and My Further Disillusionment in Russia, two parts. Right, right. And then she goes to London and she gives a talk uh, about like she's starting to attack capitalism. At the end, it's just about like what's going on in Russia is like the mother of all nightmares is far worse than the czar. And the quote was... Um, when she started her talk, uh, everyone was giving her a standing ovation. And when she stopped, it was utter silence. So she w- took on these like bougie lefties. She's like, if we're for individuals and absolute freedom of the individual and, and corporate capital is crushing them, you think Russia is the opposite? You people are assholes. And they weren't hearing it. They were <laughs> wow. not fucking hearing it. Well, this is, this is, it goes back to Walter Duranty. Oh, yes. And, I just know, read a biography of him. Right. So the entire time monster. is, is just, they knew because they knew. Yes. Right. They knew. And that all of the dispatches that were coming out of Russia where, oh, they're just downplaying it. Oh, there was, it's, it's not a fact. And it's it's you know they just had a bad bad year for for farming. That's but, all it was. And also, this is gonna usher in a new age of mankind. This whole like right. you're gonna Durante's right. the one who came up with the expression: you can't create an omelet without breaking a few eggs. And the question always is: where are the omelets? We have yeah. the gulags. I mean, you're Polish. I don't need to tell you about that history. And entire nations just destroyed and decimated. Children at school taught to turn their parents into the cops. Like uh, Pavlik Morozov in Russian school is this great hero because he called the cops on his parents. This is what you're taught. Yeah, you call the cops on your parents. You call the cops on your teachers. You yes. call the cops on your principal. Right. And and by the way, not for crimes. <laughs> the crime is be, you you committed a counter-revolutionary act. You, right. you made a counter-revolutionary statement. You know, this is what I think of the kind of like the old tweets thing now. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is, this is what yes. I compare it to. I actually wrote, wrote about this in 40 Warfare. That I was, and I was comparing it to the what went on in China, but it's you know the same deal. Um, that it's at any point in your life, if you had said or done anything, or if you were accused of it, that was good enough, right? That that was their evidentiary standard. And if um, you're the wife, now, you're a collaborator. Well, of course, obviously. But now with Twitter, yes, right now with Twitter, we've got a record of it. So now it's even worse. Yeah. But the question I have for you is: given these organizations, Antifa and the like, are so anti-corporate, why do you think corporate media covers for them? Because they're essentially doing the dirty work okay. right now because they have the same enemies. They currently have the same enemies. That'll change at some point. Like people forget that in 2016, Antifa didn't show up at the RNC. Antifa was at the DNC in Philadelphia. I was at both. Right. Antifa wasn't in Cleveland for Trump. Like they, they, they didn't think Trump was going to win. Antifa was originally anti-Hillary. Right. If you can go to the Disrupt A20 website... Uh, which was the January 20th inauguration, 2016, or I guess 2017. Um, It was originally about Hillary Clinton. And then they just changed it all to be anti-Trump, right? And so so currently there's this sort of weird um, marriage of strange bedfellows between the corporate press and Antifa in sort of a quasi anti-Trump, anti-right alignment. but pretty soon they're going to realize, um, and it, it, certainly if, if any if any Democrat gets elected, I'm, I'm sure they will at some point, um, that that Antifa is against you as well. People talk a lot of smack on Twitter around all of us. What is the one biggest misconception about you? Uh, so growing up on the border between Poland and Belarus, you know, it was always very hard for myself and for my family. Um, so my father, he worked at the, uh, essentially at the auto plant, uh, the Polish auto plant. And what they were making was was the Stugos, okay. and uh, the Stugo, as we all know, is it's it's really tough uh, car to drive uh, because it is it's stick shift. There's only two gears, and it the brakes, you know, it's it's not great. I mean, we're talking something like Flintstones level, you know, bedrock basically, you're using your feet kind of deal. And so when he was escaping across the Berlin Wall from Poland, um, it's actually what had happened was. He was driving the car up to the wall, crashes in, doesn't die, but is able to get out and get to the Americans intact, right? And get, get there and live. And so then him crossing the wall into West Berlin is what saved him. And so, but the car he had to leave on the other side, that's where all of his documents were. Everything he had was was absolutely in there. His records, my birth certificates, my parents' birth certificates, everything is back in that car all the way in East Poland. Quality wristwatches are a great way to make your look pop. And what Vincero does is they give you a quality watch at a fair price. If you go to vincerowatches.com slash malice, 
You'll have the ones I picked out and you get 15% off your entire order, which is already reasonably priced. V-I-N-C-E-R-O watches.com. They have so many to choose from. They have six collections for men, four for women. Women don't watch this show. What am I talking about here with the women? Where, if you have that watch, you could have it on a date. <sighs> men don't date who listen to this show. You could have it to the office. Well, they're not working either. Uh, it's kind of like having a friend on your wrist. And it's a nice pop of color. It's a nice pop of class. It's a nice pop of quality. And it changes the way you carry yourself. It's like being a grown-up. If you go to vincerowatches.com, V-I-N-C-E-R watches.com, slash malice, you get 15% off. I like the rose gold stuff. But that's just me. Take a look. See for yourself. Let's get back to the show. Uh, You work at One American News. I do. And you guys are kind of the scrappy young upstart against Fox. Uh, What do you think of Fox and and the direction it's taken recently? So what's what's interesting with what Fox is doing is they've been perceived as sort of having this this middling balancing effort to they're they're trying very hard to face um they're facing a lot of criticism they're facing a lot of trouble from advertiser boycotts sure. um they're facing they've lost a lot of money over that and that's hurt right that's that's hurt their wallet um this is all public you know and so i think one of the things that they're trying to do as they're they're bringing new people on their board, uh, they put you know more of these you know conservative establishment type Republicans on the board, like Paul Ryan, is that they're trying to sort of play this role of agreeing by and large with the corporate narrative, as we've discussed, and not pushing back as hard on these things, not not running their own counter narratives. No, what's interesting is because this is creating an internal tension at Fox. Because there's the news side and there's the opinion side, sure. And so, you're you listen to the news side of Fox, which is running for throughout the day, and you're getting one narrative. Then you turn on, you know, your Tucker, Hannity, Laura Ingram, and you're getting like a completely different narrative. It's 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 like watching two different channels, and and so there are people that are just it, that's causing them to tune out. That they're saying, I I like these guys, but I don't like the rest of what you're doing, and it's it's becoming annoying. Uh, they're also pointing out things like Fox calling the election in 2018 before votes were in, were done. And uh, there's a lot of people in the Republican Party who think that because Fox did that before voting had even closed in California, that that may have actually helped a lot of the Democrat candidates because Fox started calling the election for Democrats, saying House won. Um, and so for One American News, we've sort of just been, hey – we're solid, you know. We're not. We're not playing these games. We're we're pretty open about who we are. We report a lot of straight news. We don't. I mean, we only have two opinion shows. We only have two opinion shows. Uh, like everyone knows my opinion. They follow my Twitter account. Sure. I'm pretty, pretty open about it. Um, but when I'm reporting news, I'm reporting news. Right? I'm not. I'm not throwing my editorialization in there. Um, you know, if, if anything, my editorialization is in terms of uh, story selection, right? What I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to report on Antifa and, and Syria, for example. Um, but it's not, uh, it's it's not me just throwing my opinion out there anywhere. And so anybody who's watched us has has realized that. And I think that there's, I think we don't do the um, we don't do the outrage panels. You, sure. you know, like you get this across the three, uh, the other three cable networks. If if so, it's maybe like you get two or three stories an hour. And this is their structure, right? You get two or three stories an hour, and the the host or whoever the anchor is for that for that hour, they throw up a story, and then you got five people who are mad about it, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> right. And then they and they just dis- discuss varying levels of how they're mad about it. And then there's maybe one person from the other side, but like a kind of a weak person from the other side to represent an alternate argument. And they're just they're just there for everyone else to dunk on, sure, right? They're just there to everyone for to junk on, so that you, so you get that little bit of friction. But it's you know, so if if it's NBC, MSNBC or CNN. Uh, it, you get like one token and then on then Fox, now they're adding the token, right? And, and this has been something that, that people don't like. Uh, but I, I, I get what they're doing, right? I, I think it's pretty obvious. We don't do the panels at all. Um, we're doing straight news and it's it's very deliberate. It's very much that uh, that that style of the 1990s, even CNN used to use that. This is what rose them you know, to fame. Sure. Um, ESP, ESPN, Sports Center, right? You know, they used to say, yeah, you can watch Sports Center for, for 30 minutes, or watch ESPN for 30 minutes, and then it just recycles, right? So we're doing that as well. The idea is you watch us, you're getting 12 to 15 stories per hour. We're not telling you how to think about it. Who, what, where, when, why, out. Uh, were you all over that story with that seven-year-old boy 
in Texas with the mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew oh, this yeah. would be right up your alley. Can you – this is the kind of thing where I don't know that much about the story, but from what I've seen, it seemed extremely disturbing. And you're a dad with a young kid. Yeah. So can you tell us about that story and what was your reaction? Yeah. Um, you know, there was this big question. So James Younger, the seven-year-old kid, and the, the it's it's complicated, right, as, as usually as these cases are. Um, so it's it wasn't just a dispute between the mom and the dad. They were actually already divorced. And so it was actually a custody dispute, but with an added wrinkle of the father trying to maintain increased parental rights under that custody agreement because he disagreed so strongly with what the mom was essentially doing, which was, it seemed, to be leading this this child, the son, uh, down a path of transgenderism when the father was saying, you know, look, when this when this boy is with me, he he tells me that you're the one pushing this. And another added wrinkle was the fact that they were twin boys, right? He had a twin brother. And she wasn't trying to push this with the other brother. I forget his name, but the 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 son in question is James. And so they would ask the father would ask these questions. He played videos of it, then it went viral. He said, Who who's asking you to to be called as a woman or dressed like well, mommy dresses me like this? Mommy, mommy calls me this name. Mommy won't says I can't use that name anymore. So do you think you're a girl? Well, yeah. Why? Well, because mommy says I am, right? And what do you really look? I've got a one year old kid. I mean, his um, he's a year and a half, right? But his perception of the world is what I tell him it is, right? You know, he doesn't he doesn't know any better. This is, this is the difference between a child and an adult, right? When you're a child, your your programming, your your knowledge, your your experience, your lens is your parents by and large. Um, and so if I'm telling him that this is what's going on and this is what it is, of course he's going to listen to me. And if, is, and if mom is there saying that every day, of course you're going to you're not going to listen to mom. Of course, yeah. And so this this was using that influence as the mom to to push this and for uh, and uh, now uh, uh, is the Munchausen by proxy, right? You know, kind of thing going on um, where the mom wants to be able to show off. Uh, look look how you know look at how great i am as a mother look i've got twin boys and one's uh, now you know uh, a trans uh, trans female and now's the other one's male and so the judge eventually did grant custody uh rights to the father oh. where, where he would yeah so there was actually a good ending to okay. this. um the did did grant a custody agreement where the father would have some right over this because originally they were going to start him on um Hormones. On hormones, right? They were going to start the treatment. Now, just last week, the other update is that I think he's going into the first grade. Uh, as a boy. And that's coming straight up, And he's going as a boy of his own volition. Here's what I, here's why I push back on conservatives. And I got a lot of heat about this over the weekend. I said, because conservatives are uncomfortable with this whole LGBT space, right? They're letting the left write the entire narrative, right? And here's, this is a good example of that. Let's suppose the mom wasn't doing all this. Let's suppose this little boy wants to wear dresses and put on makeup and wear high heels. He could be a little gay boy. Uh, that little gay boy is not transgender. There's lots of people you and I probably know who are gay, and when they were kids, they acted like girls. They're not asking for hormones. They don't think they're women. They're just effeminate gay men. So there is a very big difference, even in LGBT, between that and transgenderism. Let's take him to the doctor and change his biology. Yeah, uh, Chris Rock actually has a line about that in one of his old stand-ups. He says, it's not, you, you didn't become gay. It's like, you always knew. Right. You always knew, right? And, and it was, you know, you it was, uh, uh, you guys are out throwing footballs there, you know, he's hula hooping. Right, but that's right? the thing. So it's like, if, if, if I mean, if you, you can even, if, you, if, you, if you're if you going to uh, convince a lot of people, you have to know how to talk to the left. If you sit down with the leftist, who instinctively now, because it's the thing to do, we have to defend transgender people, and you said to a leftist, using their language, how do you know this little kid is transgender and not just super effeminate? And they're going to be, they're not going to have an answer. And I'm like, well, in that case, don't you think maybe you should wait until you're injecting him with hormones, which affect the psychology until he's a little older? And then even they would be like, okay, you got a point. Now, th this seems like a clear example where, where state laws could be passed to block this sort of thing. I mean, and, and I think there's a clear majority in prob maybe not 50 states, but maybe 40 states where you could get something passed that says, you know, where you pick an age and you say under this age, no. Sure. Under this age, this is banned. Just just straight, flat out. Sure. But I also want think it's important to point out that the people who would say that this is oppression, they're also being hypocritical. 
Because when you're seven years old, you don't know what trans or gay means. You just want to know, I want to, I'm a boy, I want to wear high heels. So for you to project what she's doing is that a kid who has not that capacity. And that's even more dangerous to conservatives realize. Oh, precisely. Because what they're now, what they're doing is, so this runs, runs kind of counter to the arguments of, oh, well, you know, families can do whatever they want right. or individual choices. And it, it kind of cuts across a lot of those arguments because you have to realize that, look, you, you can't be ideological about this stuff. You have to be pragmatic at some yeah. point. And we know, we know that, that the human mind, it, it, the new studies are saying it, you 25 right. before your prefrontal cortex is fully formed, right? So we're not even making, you know, uh, adult decisions correctly because we're not in, in, in full concert with reality until we're 25. And we think about the things that we were allowed to do before we're 25. You get married, you drive a car, have a gun, sure. you know, all of these different things. Uh, and so to take that even dialed so far down to the age of, of seven, sorry for beating up your equipment here, uh, to the age of seven or younger, and to make these decisions where in, in many of these cases, they're uh, either permanent right. or they create permanent lasting effects on your, your psychology, your brain chemistry, things that we probably don't even really quite understand, right, at this point, uh, it's, it's, it's nuts. Uh, it, that's the other thing that's, that's amazing is that every woman recognizes that if you're pregnant, you have estrogen, you have hormones, it messes with your psychology. Somehow, if you give us hormones to seven-year-old, either steroids, which is testosterone, or estrogen, that's not going to affect a seven-year-old psychology. Like, what are you even talking? Yeah, like about? I remember. Um, so my wife Tanya, right when she when when she was pregnant, um, she would she would just start crying yeah. sometimes. She would just we'd be driving in the car. Well, you can't blame her. You know? Like, oh, come her. on. <laughs> I mean, so what have I done? No, right. So she'd be, you know, she'd be sitting there. You know, we'd be, we'd be driving in the car. We're, we're you know going to some you know going to somebody's house, going out to dinner. And then we're just driving along down the road and the tears, yeah. the tears just start, just start rolling down. And you're like, you're like, what's going on? And she goes, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. I was like, do you not want to go to for sushi? No, I love sushi. What? It's my favorite. I love it. The deliciousness of sushi. Yeah. You know, but and then she said, I just, I don't know because you can't, you can't control it. You just, when you have those hormones and at that level that are racing through the body, um, you know, you can't do this. By the way, this, this is what the, this is what the, um, the anti-vaxxers say as well, by the way. This is their, the anti-vaxxers argument. They say, well, um, some of them will come up and say, well, it's, it's not about all vaccines, but it's about the schedule. And you're putting too many vaccines at once. And because you're putting so many that that's causing problems because it's not about one vaccine in a vacuum. It's, it's when they're all colliding in a young body, right? That's, that's the vaccine schedule argument. So, are the anti-vaxxers then also going to to point out the obvious corollary to what's going on with hormones? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, those anti-vaxxers, why don't they want more libertarians? Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, looking at the democratic field, right, who would you say are the one or two that you regard as the absolute worst? Well, Bloomberg right now. I mean, Oh, I mean, interesting. Yeah, Bloomberg right now. I mean, that's just hilarious. He's the worst. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, you're, you're talking a guy. He's got like he's got the charisma of like, I don't know, uh, a, a wall of like fresh paint, you know, that's that's drying. Like, I, I, it's it's no charisma whatsoever on that guy. I mean, he bought his way into his elections in New York. Sure. Um, he's trying to do the same. And the pretty much I think the only constituency that he has for this is his own consultants who are probably going to get a lot more money and out the, of it and the media he's running. who want well, a new, uh, fresh new face right because they want a new face the issue is is that they all kind of suck right yeah. they all they just all kind of suck they're weak they're not very strong uh in terms of candidates uh, there, I think there's a tier of of pretty solid Democrat candidates or would-be potential candidates that are staying out that are just keeping out of the race and saying you know what I, I don't I don't want to deal with this I don't want to deal with this politicized environment Trump, who knows what he's going to do? Right. Like the guy, you know, you get in, you step into the ring with that guy. You you have no idea what's going to happen, right? <laughs> right? So why why go through all of that when you know that in four years, one way or another, he won't be there anymore, right? So you've got a, then you've got an open race to go for. So that's why you're seeing people like uh, Pete Buttigieg or Tulsi Gabbard, who you know, Pete's he's the mayor of a small city, right? right? Um, Tulsi, you know, she's she's a congresswoman, but they're seeing such a void, and Michael Bloomberg's seeing that as well. They're seeing such a void that they're using this as a way to to build national networks for themselves that they can then go on to use for their own purposes. It's very clever. It's very ambitious and smart. Uh, I'm I, I'm just imagining this morning. I was imagining Biden and Bloomberg on the stage. 
and Biden saying something to the effect of, look, if you were really wanted to be president, you should have run earlier. And he said, I, and Bloomberg would say to him, no, I wanted you to be president until I saw how you were running your campaign. Like it, Bloomberg's actually pretty quick. Uh, I remember he, uh, you're not a New Yorker, but he gave this talk opening Nathan's, right? And he's reading mm-hmm. this speech and he's halfway through it. He goes, who writes this shit? So there is, <laughs> he literally says that on mic. So there is a little bit of a personality there. The thing I like about him compared to the others uh, is he, I don't think he's an ideologue um, as some of the others are. I think Kamala Harris is by far the worst one. Yeah, no, uh, Kamala Harris is the worst candidate because not just that she's because of her policies, because she's inauthentic. Yes. She's so inauthentic, right? She doesn't know what identity she should embrace. Right. She doesn't seem to be able to articulate any real position for her. She doesn't know who she is, right? She's constantly trying to, she's, she's trying to be water, right? To fit whatever vessel she's in at the moment, whatever, you know, whatever environment she's in at the moment. She's trying to fit, well, if these are the politics I'm supposed to be, if these are the songs I'm supposed to like, if these, this is the, uh, these are the drugs I'm supposed to have used at a certain time, then I'm going to just say that I did that, right? And it's, it's like Hillary Clinton had the same problem. Um, Elizabeth Warren is more authentic. Yeah. Um, but Elizabeth Warren's, you know, the, the, you know, the Native American stuff aside, uh, she's much more authentic politically. The problem is that it scares the hell out of Wall Street and Silicon Valley. And they're coming forward and saying, yeah, we're not going to support here, which is, by the way, is, is a great, there's a great discussion to be had there is, why is it newsworthy every time a billionaire talks about how much they don't like Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> right. yeah, 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 yeah. Right? It's like, wait, 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 wait. Who's, in, wait, who's, who's making these decisions here? Like, you're kind of, we were talking about red pills before. Like, that's, isn't that kind of a red pill uh, on that perspective? Well, that if you can't get billionaires to support you, then you're not allowed to be president? <laughs> right. I, I, I would, let me go back to my, uh, you know, my American founding and see if I can find that. One of your, one of my things that bothers me on the internet when people say things like, oh, no one has a chance against Trump. And to me, in a country that's divided this way, that that does not make sense statistically. Do you think Trump is a shoe in No, I don't think Trump's a shoe in because, uh, and and Steve Bannon talks about this quite regularly on his podcast as well. That you know Donald Trump won with, I mean, it was a squeaker. Right? Yeah, seventy nine thousand votes across three states: my home state of Pennsylvania, uh, then Wisconsin, Michigan. You flip those, he's not president. Right, right. So that's that's not a lot of votes, right? That's not a huge coalition. Seventy nine thousand people. Uh, I mean, that's like that's like a you know like a, like a sporting event, like a Queen concert. It's my Twitter following. It's, yeah, pretty. That's much. literally my Twitter following. Is seventy nine. You have seventy nine already. It's seventy eight this morning. Thanks oh, for, there you thanks go. for calling me out of my bullshit. <laughs> I'm good. I there's one thing. If you're on Twitter enough, you remember the numbers. You remember the numbers. You're at what, like four ninety five? Uh, five seventy one. Oh wow. Okay. That's, that's how did you build your Twitter following that big? I've been on Twitter forever. Okay. Uh, I've been on Twitter since twenty twelve. Uh, though I wasn't doing politics. And from 2012 to about 2016, I only had about 10,000 followers because all I used it for was to rip on Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay. That's literally all I did. Okay. I had this account called Angry GOT Fan, and I tweeted in all caps. And I was just like, this, so su- this show sucks. This is can- Why isn't this canceled yet? These writers know what they're talking about. Read the books. You're all a bunch of idiots. Uh, and then it was completely pro- proven right by season yeah, eight. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and that's where everyone, everyone realized that I was right about that all along. Um, but then it got boring, and, and Donald Trump... Um, started running and said, oh, this is more interesting. So maybe I'll just tweet about politics now. But I mean, there's lots of people tweeting about politics. So how is it that your audience, you, you know, you got such a huge uh, market share? Yeah, so uh, I'm just better at it. Than <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how to, you know, <laughs> I didn't know, put it out that way. I mean, I run Twitter, like it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. No, um, I, I, de- I first started getting big during during the election, and I, and I think there might be kind of a, you know, I don't know if the bubble is burst in terms of like being big on Twitter. I mean, it's, it's very hard to build a, a, you know, a big following on Twitter now. Um, but it was during the election, there was this huge groundswell of people coming into Twitter because of Donald Trump, yes. because he used Twitter. So people said, oh, I better sign up for this thing because of Trump. And so they had people talk about pre-Trump Twitter because it was a different place. It was a different universe yeah. uh, before, before that groundswell of people came in. And by the way, that's people who are pro-Trump and people who are anti-Trump. They realize they say, oh, this is the battlefield. So everybody moved in. And so the, the not, I mean, Twitter loves it, obviously. I'm sure Jack Dorsey uh, was loving it. And, and in terms of the, the increased usage, but it changed the flavor of what Twitter was. And it changed the essential DNA of Twitter in a sense. And so I was going to these events as a volunteer, as a supporter throughout 2016. And one of the biggest things, and it's 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 kind of silly to even talk about it now, but going back to 2016, 
Remember, everybody thought Trump was a flash in the pan. Right. Um, and they said that wasn't serious. And he's not going to support. He's, he's a clown. He's a clown. clown. Yeah. He's probably working for Hillary anyway. Yeah. Publicity stunt. Yeah, publicity stunt. He's just trying to... Oh, oh. Uh, Rachel Maddow still, still to this day says that it was all just a negotiating tactic with NB, uh, NBC for his, um, Apprentice. his TV show, The okay. Apprentice Show. Uh, that he was trying to get more money. And so... And then he accidentally got elected president. Hilarious. And so... I was going to these Trump rallies and I was saying, man, there's a lot of people here. This is, this is big. Yeah. You know, this is like a big story, but the, the media wouldn't show it. Okay. Right. And so, and it's, it's funny to mention now because it's just, it's ubiquitous, right? It's ubiquitous. Trump has big rallies, right? It's just obvious, right? It's just an obvious thing. Jack has like more Twitter followers than anyone. Like it's ubiquitous. <laughs> um, so. You earned that boast. Trump <laughs> going to everywhere in the country. And drawing these massive crowds was huge. I mean, places like Miami, yeah. he's growing massive crowds. And he's, he's going to like California and drawing massive crowds. He's not, he's not only going to red states and doing this. And that's why it was such a big deal. And part of it's, it's the sideshow. Part of it's just the, the name brand of this pop culture icon, which he was. And I think it's weird that people try to not describe him in those senses because he was a pop culture icon for 40 years. And this is why people don't quite understand they, a lot of people get trump wrong uh, especially a lot of republicans get trump wrong they think oh you could say whatever you want you don't have to apologize anymore yeah you can do that if your name is donald trump it's very weird when they say like oh he's just a reality show star it's like it's not like he's richard hatch this guy was a media personality for many years and the apprentice isn't a reality show in the sense that they're thinking he's the, he's like simon cowell right i mean technically you could say simon cowell is a reality tv star but you also think of him as a successful business mogul, or someone who breaks people out. Yeah, or uh, Mark Cuban. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah, very so weird. to put him to put him there, and, and all all the cameos he was in, and all the movies and TV shows, and everything that he's done, uh, huge publicity in in the '90s, every tabloid going on Howard Stern right. all the time, and so it, the guy was a pop culture icon. Right. And so he leveraged that into politics. Right. That's very different than, you know, Joe Schmo coming up and saying, I'm going to run for, uh, you know, West Virginia County Council and I'm going to be just like Trump. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. And so so understanding that and kind of playing along with it as well then. But I would also go to the Hillary events. Right. And I would go to her rallies and I would go to uh, the DNC. And man, this stuff was dead. There was like nobody there. There was like nobody there. It was like it was like um, you know, one of those uh, one of those like Beatles, you know, reunion fantasy shows. Where, <laughs> Beatlemania. Yeah, Beatlemania, where people were the only people who go. But not not like the Beatlemania. I mean, like the ones now. Okay. Where, like the only people who go are just like these creepy old guys who are like, yeah, Beatles. Um, and I, I have nothing against it. I love the Beatles, but it's just like, guys, come on, it's over. Like it's you know, it's, it was it was older, and so there's nobody showing up, and the people who are showing up are kind of, uh, and uh, you know, they're kinda, it's kind of like the Adams family, and so you like literally like disembodied hands walking around, and <laughs> and and a ton of lurches, so many lurches, and I mean, look at Joe Biden, right? He's basically Lurch. Um, you know, I don't know why they're letting him Actually, run. Actually, Lurch runs this network. His name's Ralph Sutton. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but that's a, he, yeah, it's a thing. Trust me. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's yeah. good. Was that who answered the door when I walked in? Oh, no, 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 no. That was, uh, I think, was that Eric? Was that no, but, I mean, but that's oh, what Lurch does when so he answers the door. Oh, no, no. He he actually runs this place. That, yeah. No, but it was you haven't met Lurch. Oh, I'm, I'm missing out. Yeah, you are missing out. I'm totally missing out. Yeah. I'm totally missing out. But anyway, so so I'm going to all this stuff. And then th there was a sense of, in 2016, of when you follow these guys, and there, it wasn't just me, it was myself, uh, you know, Bill Mitchell back in the day, oh, yeah. Mike Cernovich, um, Scott Adams, that if you followed us, that you were getting the real story okay. of what was going on in that election in a way that Fox, MSNBC, etc., were not telling you. Because there was no smirk on your face like they all had. Exactly. Covering Trump. Exactly. Uh, I got two simple questions that are controversial. Okay. We'll stop. Do you think Epstein was murdered? So this is, and like people are going to get mad when I say this, right? But like, I'm one of the few people who does think Epstein committed suicide. Okay. I actually think he committed suicide. And I base that on a lot of things. Um, predominantly my experience. So I served at Guantanamo Bay for a year. Oh, right? wow. Holy shit. Yeah. I spent, I spent a year in there. I was in the interrogation cell. Um, I, I wrote a lot of papers about 
uh, suicide in, you know, essentially a prison situation, detention center. It's really easy to commit suicide in one of those things. And we had just had it before I had gotten there in 2012, we had just had a suicide. And so this was something that everybody was freaked out about, you know, don't let the detainees commit suicide. Don't do that. Right. Um, we, we are not allowing it. Right. And even, even, even to the point of where, um, there was a hunger strike when I was there as well. And we were still not allowed them to die by a hunger strike, which meant, you know, basically forced feeding, which is fun. Um, not that I was doing that, sure. but you know, I did watch it a couple of times. Um, it's, it's, it's not as like horrific as people make it sound like it's like, they just, it's like a tube, but it's still not fun. No, it's not fun. Yeah, yeah. And so you realize that when there are people who are on the bubble, um, in some cases, no, obviously they were doing it for ideological reasons, sure. religious reasons. Uh, Epstein was doing it for psychological reasons, if you know, if he committed suicide. Um, but there's still uh, a list, essentially, of of indicators, right, of suicide indicators. And one of the biggest ones, one of the absolute biggest ones, is knowing that you're never going to see the light of day again, never going to breathe fresh air again. And when when Epstein lost his appeal, when his bail his his bail was rejected, I mean, he knew he knew he was done at that point. Right. He knew that you know you you have you have lost all your cards. There are no cards left to play, right? So suicide becomes, it seems to become a viable option at that point when you realize there's no cards left to play. Um, then another huge indicator is giving away your personal belongings. Yes. Two days before he died, he signs that will. Okay. And he kind of names this this estate lawyer that who didn't even know that he was going to be named. It was just a guy he had worked with in the past or something. And... Essentially, it gets it gets put into this trust where he kind of locks up all of his all of his assets and then signs it over to this guy who doesn't really have great access to it either. And so, him doing that two days prior is actually a huge indicator that he was not planning to go forward. Now, there's other indicators, and so and I, and I'll, I can be objective about this because there's also uh, some stories about him trying to pay off women right while he was still in jail. Right for that, for that, uh, I think it was a month or two while he was still while he was locked up. That he was trying to pay off women to essentially back him up or to not, um, you know, not corroborate any of the allegations that were coming out. So why would you do that if you were not worried about trying to beat the charge, right? And so, um, you know, Dershowitz, who you know may or may not be involved in, in some of this, he pointed out. He said, "Look, I, I think the guy was just going back and forth in his in his mind, and you know, when he came up with, you know, he came. That's that's what he ended up on. Now that being said." Were the conditions absolutely perfect for him to commit suicide? Yes, they were. And why was it like that, right? right? So when you've got a guy who's on suicide watch, and I know because I've, I've actually put other human beings on suicide watch or, or at least recommended them for suicide watch, right? That's, that's 24 hours. And I don't mean like 24 hours like I'm around you. That means um, when we would put guys on suicide watch, it's when you're in the shower, we've got like a peephole in the shower, like a little glass um, where we're watching through the door and you're not allowed to turn around. You it's face forward. Because we if you Wait, you're making eye contact with the dude? Not me. Whoever's <laughs> doing watching it? Not me, but the, yeah, the watcher. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, 24 hour suicide <laughs> watch is no joke. No joke, dude. Wow. And so you've got to watch them literally bathe themselves because you turn around in a shower, you grab something sure. off, you have okay. a shiv, you can you know, wrists done, right? It's really fast. And so when someone's on suicide watch or they're on that bubble for suicide, you've got to maintain that level of scrutiny. I mean, and that's, yeah. and that's, that's why I say it, and it's kind of shocking to say that, but that's, that's a point out is you have to maintain that level. And to see so many lapses, right? The guy's falling asleep, the camera's not working. You realize that, you know, whether or not that was deliberate, these were absolutely the perfect conditions for suicide. Do you think Hillary Clinton has ever been involved in a murder? Do I think Hillary Clinton? Well, I mean, we know she's been involved in murder. Not like so. Libya and, and Benghazi. I mean, like an illegal murder. Um, we certainly know that there have been killings or deaths that she's been, I'm, I'm giving you a total political answer, aren't I? Um, that's, you know, <laughs> that have benefited her, right? That have, that have absolutely benefited her. <laughs> I didn't know her. you were a tap dancer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, like, I'm from Washington, right? Uh, <laughs> But you know, it's 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 one of those things where you, you can never really pin it down. Okay. You can you could just never really pin it down. And anytime you you chase you go down the rabbit hole of any one of those, you know, there's this list out there. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, the Clinton, you know, the Clinton body Kill counts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and if you if you go down the rabbit hole of any of these, it just 
it, it just takes you into this huge cloud of confusion and gray area and you just don't and disinformation and you just really don't know. But we do know, by the way, about Troopergate, right? We know that they were using uh, former state troopers when they were in Arkansas to cover up a lot of Bill's infidelities, sure. right? And by the way, this was written by David Brock, yeah, right? The, the guy who now founded Media Matters. But before he, basically, like, he did such a good job of exposing Troopergate that the Clintons basically hired him and yeah. said, look, you're, you're such a threat to us that we're going to put you on our side now and use your operations against our opponents. And he sold out, right? He, and, he, and he went along with it. And so they realized that they needed somebody like that on their team. What for? Right, what for? And why are there so many questions? Right, there, there was a meme the other day. Um, you know, <laughs> how many of Donald Trump's accusers have committed suicide? <laughs> 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 it's never happened, right? <laughs> you know, they're all they're all still walking around. Stormy Daniels walking around. You know, she's still stripping. She's still on the pole. You know, it's perfectly fine. You, you can accuse Donald Trump of anything. You'll be fine. Rape. You're, you'll, you'll be on CNN in five minutes. Right, you're CNN in five minutes. So did, did the president use a condom? Stand, you know. <laughs> they think it's sexy. They think of the fantasy. It's so weird. It's so weird. Jack, we're out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Uh, probably my favorite part was me just, just beating up your equipment as much as possible to see, to see what, 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 you know, how far I could get under your skin before you said anything. You are welcome.